good. All good. Perfect. Seamless. I won't make any mistakes. Okay. Thank you, John. Uh, it's nice to talk to you all. Uh, I'm going to talk for, you know, 45 ish minutes uh, about some stellar activity work that I've done um, and others uh, along with me have done. I'll, I'll get citations throughout. Um, I think this would be a lot of review for some of you. Um, I hope it's exciting for some of you. Um, Kepler K2, and I'm including Gaia, even though it's not, I think, officially um, part of the, the missions that I've worked on, but we, we everybody uses Gaia data now. And so it's this combination of this amazing space-based data, which Gaia certainly qualifies as, um, which in any a couple of years, we'll, we'll be rewriting this talk with uh, doubling the data with Gaia. So I think this is a really special time, a special opportunity to study stars and stellar activity uh, and try to understand things around other stars like we do uh, on our own sun. Uh, but first, let me give just a, a brief introduction to myself. Um, here is some fancy stock footage that I found on the University of Washington's website. Uh, this is our building. Um, this is the Physics and Astronomy Building. Uh, we are on the third floor here. Uh, the bird just flew above us um, where, where our, my office is. Um, so sort of in the middle of the building, we have the third floor. Physics is above and below us, but that's okay. We try not to feel offended that they get more space than we do. Uh, and on the top floor um, is the e-science, the Interdisciplinary e-science Institute, which combines data science and computer science and astronomy and other domain sciences. So I am, as John said, the associate director of the Dirac Institute, which exists within the astronomy department. It's the data intensive research in astrophysics and cosmology. I don't know anything about cosmology, but I got the rest of it. Um, and uh, we try to bring together people who are interested in programs like LSST and the Vera Rubin Observatory, um, missions like TESS, uh, other sources of uh, large data sets, um, time domain astronomy, things like that are our focus. Um, it is a great acronym. Um, if, you, if you're into acronyms, it's a great acronym. Uh, we've got a nice uh, hoodie. It's a very co cozy hoodie. If you come out and visit, I'll give you one of these hoodies. Um, uh, it is, however, a, a difficult acronym in the fact that Dirac, um, the actual scientist Dirac, didn't work on anything related to the stuff that we do. Um, and actually was a theorist and didn't work on any data. So it's actually a terrible acronym if you think about um, the namesake. Um, thankfully, I'm not responsible for the acronym. I just I just keep the place running. So come out and visit. I swear it looks like this every day in Seattle. Um, OK, so I'm going to talk about uh, what is, and this is a punny title here, a, a revolution that has happened in stellar rotation uh, over the past roughly 10, maybe 12 years. Um, and that, that is that uh, our knowledge starts in sort of the time of Galileo, uh, learning that the sun, in fact, rotates. Uh, here pictured is the sun rotating. This is uh, several days uh, movie from Solar Dynamics Observatory. You can see some very boring normal star spots. Um, it's a little more active than the sun is right now, unfortunately. The sun's pretty boring right now. Um, and so our knowledge of uh, stellar activity uh, and stellar magnetic fields really is born out of this fact that the star... Um, that we orbit rotates. Uh, and a lot of things and time scales are driven out of this rotation um, and differential rotation and all the other physics that are going on in the sun. Um, the revolution comes in that before, in 2009, when Kepler launched, before Kepler launched, there was something like order of a thousand stars for which we could measure the rotation period. This was difficult work by today's standards. Uh, you had to go take a spectrum, a pretty high resolution spectrum, uh, and the line broadening of that spectrum would give you something like uh, the, velo the surface velocity uh, modulo the inclination. So you'd get V sine I. Um, and then you could play some games and maybe do a little better and constrain the inclination somehow. Um, but really, it was of order a thousand, maybe a couple thousand stars, period, of which this measurement had been done and was possible. Um, and so rotation was not seen... Uh, as something that we use to characterize stars. We had things like color and temperature, maybe luminosity, um, but the rotation rate was not something that we could do in an ensemble statistical sense. Uh, enter these amazing space-based photometric missions like Kepler and then TESS and Gaia. And this has really revolutionized our ability to measure this fundamental stellar property, this really fundamental facet uh, that drives a lot of activity on the sun, which is rotation. So how do you measure the rotation from light curves alone? We can't see the spots moving over the surface. Instead, we can imply their presence. This is an old gif that I made of a circular spot rolling around on a perfectly uniform sphere. Uh, and you can see when the spot is away from you, the star is bright. And when the spot rolls into view, the brightness goes down. You get this sort of sinusoidal-like modulation. And we see this in data. We see um, here is an example figure from 
Lucian Walkowicz's paper on M dwarfs. This is a paper that kind of changed my life and blew my mind when I first saw this. Here is just four random M dwarfs from the very first quarter, the Q0 data of Kepler. Um, and it kind of looks like a cartoon almost. It looks like the data that you would manufacture if you were trying to teach a class on this. You've got quasi sinusoidal mo uh, modulation from that spot or spot uh, features rolling around on the surface. And then here we have flares. Now I've done a lot of work on flares and I'll come back to them at the very end. But uh, today I really just wanna talk and focus on rotation because I think this is where a lot of the future is. Uh, and uh, it's a really big point of, I think the Kepler and soon the test legacy. So this is just four M dwarfs, four random uh, no name M dwarfs. Uh, and the real revolution I think began uh, in about 2013 in 2014, when Amy McQuillan worked uh, for her thesis work with uh, Susanna Grain in Oxford, published this incredible uh, now benchmark catalog of 30, 34,000 roughly rotation periods uh, from Kepler. So in this uh, lovely cyan diagram, which they call the shrimp, which I think is very cute. Uh, they call this the shrimp diagram because they think it looks like a, or maybe they call it the prawn, I guess they're in the UK. Anyway, so here's the shrimp or the prawn. It looks kind of like the legs of a shrimp, I guess, um, or the tail. Um, and you can see there's a wide range of masses here from above, higher than solar mass all the way down to sort of the mid M dwarfs. Um, the sun is in this uh, red star here. Um, so it's sort of on the upper edge of this diagram uh, with a rotation period, a sort of average rotation period around 25 days. There's overlays here of various clusters and subpopulations that don't matter. Um, to orient you in this diagram, this is a diagram we're gonna come back to over and over and over throughout this talk. Um, this is the, the characteristic rotation period versus age diagram. Uh, and to give you some, some, some orientation here, we think that through the, the classical rules of angular momentum loss, things should slow down. But if you spin a top on the table, it should lose angular momentum. In the case of a table, it's because of friction and wobble and air resistance and all these things. In the case of a star, it loses its angular momentum because of winds uh, and particles flying off. It's like the... Um, figure skater putting their arms out, slowing themselves down. You have a torque from mass literally leaving the surface. And so we look at this diagram and we think we see evidence of age, that stars should move effectively vertically on this diagram. They should be born with some initial rapid rotation and they should slow down over time. And the degree to which that is smooth and consistent um, and uniform uh, develops a technique that we call gyrochronology or the um, spin clock spin down, as it's called. I like this figure from this manifold from Soren Maibom that kind of maps this out, that there is a mass and age or a color and age dependency. And here, um, 10 years ago, you could see the sort of three or four open clusters that were used to sort of benchmark this. And the sun is like one infinitesimal little dot there in age and mass space. So this is gyrochronology. And this is another one of those papers that like causes you to drop what you're doing and, and change the course of your career, if you're me. Um, so this is a really cool uh, data set. And one thing that uh, McQuillan at all noticed was that there was a bimodality in the period. They first noticed this in the M dwarf. So here I, in the right, I've highlighted just that little sliver of the prawn of the shrimp diagram, where you can maybe see that there's kind of two clumps. There's a higher clump and a lower clump. And then here on the left, um, I put the big red circle around the, the histogram in log period space. And you can see there's sort of two populations of stars. Um, and the bottom panels show this in terms of scatter. So trying to see if the, it's, it's a, uh, something to do with the spot amplitudes and there doesn't seem to be any correlation there. Um, in fact, I think I've drawn misleading ovals here. So anyways, there's two populations, this bimodality or, or, or equivalently a gap. There is maybe a smooth underlying population and a gap right in the middle. At first, we thought about this as a bimodality. First, they observed it in 2013 in the M dwarfs. Then they expanded their sample to the full 30,000 stars from Kepler that could have rotation periods measured. Um, and they saw evidence here, this is kind of a, a dense diagram, but the point is here on the right, that the K in the M dwarfs showed evidence of this bimodality. And that by the time you got into the, sort of the G and the F stars, there was no indication of a bimodality. So the mystery deepened. Why is there um, a gap or, a or two clumps of stars, as it were, in this age period space? What might that mean? And why does it seem to only occur for the K and the M dwarfs and not the F and the G stars, um, which have been theorized to all you know, from anywhere there's a convective envelope. So from mid F 
down to M dwarfs. Anywhere there's a convective envelope, we think this sort of angular momentum loss mechanism should work. And this gyrochronology to an extent should hold. So, so the question that was posed in 2013 and has remained an active question in area investigation, is gyrochronology broken? Is there something fundamentally wrong about our assumption of angular momentum loss? Now, this model was proposed in, um, really in detail in the 1970s, that there should be this smooth wind-driven angular momentum loss or breaking of the uh, spin, breaking like pedaling the brakes on your car. And so this uh, bimodal distribution suggests one of two things. Number one, the simplest explanation, I think, is that it is encoding that it by oh, sorry, the gyrochronology does work and that it's encoding the star formation history, right? So that if this vertical direction on the diagram is time or age, this would indicate a burst of star formation uh, recently, then a gap in star formation, and then another burst. And maybe it's in logarithmic time or something. So they're log bursts of star formation. Okay, that's the easiest read of this diagram. The second is that the gap is actually that there is no gap in star formation. Instead, the gap is a break in the stellar spin down that somehow angular momentum loss does not proceed uniformly. And stars are jumping over this point that this is a sort of semi forbidden region in angular momentum space for the star. This is um, completely unsupported by any predictions um, 10 years ago. Uh, similarly, uh, 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 proposition number one is also unsupported. We have other estimates of the star formation history of the Milky Way and the disk of our galaxy, and there's no indication that there was a really recent localized burst of star formation in the last half uh, giga year or so. I we would have probably noticed a big cluster of young stars right in our face, um, and there's not uh, an indication of that in the field. So um, number one totally clashes with our understanding of the galaxy. And number two is completely unsupported uh, by our understanding of angular momentum and winds from stars, not that we know them that well. So I love that both of these are perplexing or problematic explanations because that is what we call job security. Um, and so we got a ADAP, a NASA ADAP award uh, about three or four years ago to study this, to try to expand our understanding of this feature. Where is it, where is it from? Okay, so further evidence that gyrochronology is potentially broken um, came from another group from Jen Van Sater's work. Um, this was a really cool nature paper. Um, so other evidence that gyrochronology, that this spin down is perhaps not smooth, uh, and there's some so other funny business going on, um, is that at the very top edge of this diagram, here I've highlighted that in this sort of purple marker streak, um, we see sort of a hard edge that there are F stars that could have a uh, spin down uh, rates of 20 or 30 days that we would have been sensitive to in Kepler, and we don't see them. Instead, we see this hard sort of upper edge. Um, and this is supported by in the handful of stars where there are independent age measurements. This is hard work to get independent age measurements. Um, but here for F, G, and K stars, there seems to be, and there was, this is much debated, there seems to be a break from the expected spin down. If you, these curves here and colors are spin down, I think the black line is spin down for just wind driven um, angular momentum loss. And what we see is that the G stars right after the age of the sun for the middle panel here, right after about four giga years, the G stars stop spinning down as efficiently. Instead, they fall below that black line. <clears throat> and so Jen's work was in trying to figure out um, what could be the cause and uh, what uh, rotation period or what we would say what Rosby number this occurs at. And there does seem to be some point at which the star, um, they, she, called it, she called it broken breaking, um, where it no longer can lose angular momentum as efficiently as it did. So whatever the wind that it's producing um, either turns off or becomes much less efficient um, in terms of dragging angular momentum from the star. So this was a cool independent line of reasoning that maybe spin down is not as simple as just a steady wind flying off the star for all time. Um, that, of course, nature is tricky. So where my work picked up uh, a few years ago was in ex ex trying to explore this first uh, conundrum, which is why did in the Kepler sample, we only see this for the K and the M stars and not really for the G and the F stars. Why is there a mass dependence? Is this real? And so enter this other helpful mission, Kepler plus Gaia. Um, what we noticed when we started looking at the sample of rotation periods that uh, McQuillan et al. had generated, that Amy had worked on for her thesis, there is a wonderful range here. This is the Gaia DR2 color magnitude diagram. There's a wonderful range here 
of spectral types of masses, you can definitely see a cluster of uh, potentially equal mass binary stars up there above the main sequence, which is really fun. But there's this big cloud of dots um, up above this sort of notional zero age main sequence in black here uh, for the G stars here with colors bluer than about one. Um, brightness is above uh, absolute magnitude of four. We call this the subgiant branch. This is the turnoff in the subgiants. Uh, and there's a lot of work and fascinating work about what happens to the envelope of a star when fusion starts turning off and um, support from fusion starts to go away and the envelope changes its size. This is a, there are many PhD theses to be written here uh, about understanding this, uh, what happens when a star journeys from the main sequence to the giant branch. But for us, for those interested in trying to age date the stars on the main sequence, this is all noise. These stars are out of bounds because they aren't experiencing the same wind driven angular momentum loss. And so by just taking a nice little box here in pink and throwing out all the stuff in blue, uh, these subgiants or anything that's a post main sequence object, just being a really strict about throwing out the binaries as best you can and just getting the main sequence stars. Then we start realizing that the contamination in these G stars was super high. There's a ton of subgiants um, that were stuck in the Kepler data that weren't known to be subgiants. And so what we find, uh, this was with the DR1 results for Gaia, but with the same thing was true in DR2. So here is the histogram of rotation periods on the left, um, centered around that the rotation period of the gap for those stars. So it's in sort of obtuse units here, I apologize. And the point is in Orange was the histogram before, which is equivalent to what McQuillan et al. had seen for F and G stars, that there is no bimodality, it's just a smooth distribution of periods. Uh, and after we throw out all the subgiants, you get a nice bimodal peak right where you expect it, um, or bimodal gap or whatever, right where you expect it, um, that there is a population of rapid rotators to the left and slow rotators to the right, right where you expect them. Uh, and it was just subgiants in the way interfering with our understanding of rotation period space. So sorry, subgiants, out you go. So we whittled this sample from about in half uh, down to the, the most likely single main sequence objects we can. Um, and what we can see here, I've highlighted it because it gets a little hard to see in the uh, higher mass stars, um, is there is a nice little gap. This is my PowerPoint uh, gyrochrone, we call them. It's like an isochrone, a gyrochrone um, that nicely traces out this bimodality uh, and seems to follow nearly a single age sequence. Very fascinating. Um, it looks roughly like a 600 million year old uh, gap. This at the time in 2018, we wrote this, suggested to us that maybe it is star formation. It's, it was kind of wild that it, this gap seemed to follow the prediction of a single age um, in the gyrochronology model, um, that there might be a gap. There might have been a burst of star formation somewhat locally or down in the disk. Um, there was other evidence that higher up in the disk, you didn't see this gap as much. Um, when you started to get to the sort of the thick disk, as it's called, region. So this was very suggestive that maybe it was age. Maybe this is just simply star formation history encoding itself. And that this gap or this bimodality is just simply star formation history. There's other problems which we'll return to. Um, but this was very interesting. One problem, though, is that Kepler just stared at one field of view for four years. It was a great data set and really wonderful if you wanted to understand rotation period. You could come back month after month, uh, year after year, and make sure that your signal was good, that you had the right rotation period, no matter what the star spots were doing. But it is one field of view. And you don't know when you have a sample of one, like so many things in science, we don't know if that sample um, is representative. Maybe this localized burst star formation just ha happened in the direction of the Kepler field. Maybe we were looking into some cluster or some feature that we didn't understand um, or hadn't detected yet. So the next uh, challenge was to figure out, was this feature ubiquitous? And the next successor to Kepler, and here I'll turn the spacecraft, was the K2 mission. So Kepler lost its ability to point at its single stable field of view, which it had stared at throughout its main mission for four years. But the very crafty engineers of Ball Aerospace and with NASA figured out a way to get the spacecraft to point semi stably for something like 70 to 90 day periods by keeping its back to the wind and essentially it used the solar radiation pressure to sort of keep itself sailing quasi stable. So it could point to these fields of view along the ecliptic um, for something like a quarter. 
uh, or, or uh, three months roughly of the year. And then they would have to turn the spacecraft to keep its back to the sun. So over the course of four years, Kepler doubled its sample size uh, in terms of observation, and it um, vastly expanded the numbers of lines of sight. It went from one line of sight that was kind of um, up above the galactic plane to 20 or 18, I guess 19 technically, 19 lines of sight um, that it surveyed um, over the four years, giving us um, many finger, uh, many uh, pencil beams, many fingers of uh, observation throughout the galaxy that we could test um, this basic question of does this bimodality exist only in the Kepler field, or is this something to do um, with the construction of our galaxy more, uh, more generally? Now, of course, there is one degeneracy left, which is it's the same spacecraft, and uh, we'll get we'll return to that at the end. Uh, so there, it's possible that right we're that Kepler itself is somehow haunted and it gives us the signal. I don't think that's the case. So um, what follows is work that uh, a student I've been working with, Tyler Gordon, um, has submitted. You can find it on the archive. It's undergoing um, a favorable referee review right now. Um, we set out to model every light curve from K2, which had not been done, uh, to model the light curves to do a uniform, robust search for rotation periods from every light curve in K2, just like what was done in 2013 and 2014 with Kepler, roughly 200,000 light curves in Kepler. So we've doubled the sample uh, of observable stars. We don't have years of data. Instead, we only have about 70, 80 days for a star. So you need to be a lot more careful and a lot more sure that the rotation periods you pull out are real. Um, so we used a, a much more sophisticated method than was used before. In Kepler, they used the autocorrelation function, which has become sort of now a standard approach for measuring rotation periods. And here, instead, Tyler, as part of his thesis work, um, is using a, a Gaussian process with a periodic kernel. So it's a semi-parametric flexible model, which only encodes sort of with a characteristic time scale, but it doesn't enforce a strict periodicity uh, in the light curve. So here um, you can see there's an example on the left of sort of a moderate rotation period, something like uh, 12 days. Uh, on the right, a rapid rotation period with, uh, stronger, with strong spot evolution as well. And it, it's able to capture both of these features uh, very robustly. So this is a great um, data product in itself. Even for stars, we don't have robust rotation periods. If you wanted to go do a new search for exoplanets or eclipsing binaries or other weird things that go pump in the night, this is a great data set. Um, and we're going to we're releasing the uh, detrended light curves, the Gaussian process models for all the light curves as as a byproduct of this data. Um, so if you're interested in modeling things with K2, this is a great data set to check out. Um, one of the byproducts, just to take a very short tangent here, is that the Gaussian process also quantifies how stable um, the features are in time. And so the so-called quality factor, or Q, that is used in the hyperparameter of the Gaussian process. Um, this hyperparameter characterizes how stable the features are from period to period. So here on the right is just like 10 examples uh, of the same periodic um, signal, but drawn from different models with different cues. And so on the bottom where the quality factor is low, you just get random noise. The noise terms dominate. And on the top where the quality factor is very high, you have an incredibly high quality, stable periodic signal um, that looks here just kind of like a damped sine wave, a very in phase, very stable. Um, and so this is, I think, a really interesting way of quantifying how stable star spots are, how stable things like differential rotation might be. I think there's a lot of future here. So again, there's great data products here, even for stars, where we're not sure if the rotation period is super robust. Uh, but what's cool is even using really strict cutoffs about the quality factor and the error bars, we, we did the Gaussian process with MCMC, so we have big error bars that we can explore. Uh, so even requiring great Gaia measurements and great rotation periods, uh, we're able to add almost 9,000 new rotating stars to the sort of Kepler family of rotation periods. So again, compared to 10 years ago, this would have been a groundbreaking sample. Adding eight, uh, almost 9,000 new stars of rotation periods would have just dominated any measurements of rotation in the field. And we have many lines of sight, which is really exciting. So. We did the same sort of game using the Gaia color magnitude diagram, cut out the subgiants, cut out the obvious binaries, just look for the most likely main sequence single stars that we can. And the drum roll, the whole reason we set out to write this proposal and this paper was we can see the rotation period bimodality very, very clearly in the K2 data. So here is the ensemble of all 8,943 
high quality, high fidelity rotation periods measured using the Gaussian process. Uh, we do compare it with the autocorrelation function Lone Scargo. You can see these features as well. Um, and you can see very clearly, or at least I hope you can see very clearly, uh, that the prawn, that the shrimp is there, that there is this gap sort of slanted with the rotation period envelope, um, especially prominent in the uh, K and M dwarfs here, starting with colors of about 0.8 um, out to one. So this is a huge victory, and I'm super duper excited about this. So I, I hope you all will check out Tyler's paper just for this figure alone, because I think it's a total slam dunk and makes me really excited. We can see the bimodality in other stars beyond just the Kepler field. Um, now, again, there is a possibility that Kepler is haunted. We, this feature has not been detected robustly with any other telescope yet, uh, at least in the published literature that I'm aware of. But uh, it's really exciting that we can see it with totally different data processing and totally different lines of sight. Um, we have different lines of sight. Uh, and so if we start measuring where the gap is and how wide the gap or how, how far apart the bimodality is, um, or where the middle of that gap is. Um, we can do a precise tracing of where the gap is within each line of sight, because um, again, we're probing many lines of sight throughout the galaxy out to about a kiloparsec in each direction. Um, and the figure on the right, the takeaway here is that on average, when we sort of take a kernel density smoothing of these features, uh, the gap is roughly in the same direction. So um, this suggests to us, since if you look a kiloparsec in one direction, a kiloparsec in another direction in the galaxy, in the leading and the trailing direction of the galaxy, there's no time dependence. This is not a feature of star formation rolling through a spiral arm or anything like that. Um, you know, if, you, if you look through sort of the um, whoop, the sort of Q zero, that's uh, sector zero, sector thirteen compared to sector nine. You know, sort of leading and trailing edges in the galaxy. There is no dependence on where you're looking or how high you're looking. The gap is always in the same place. Um, and so we think this pretty conclusively rules out star formation history by itself. We think this really favors something going wrong or, or unexpected with spin down, with gyrochronology. Um, so is gyrochronology broken? Uh, yes, yes, we think it is. We think this is more evidence. There's other evidence in the literature, um, as we mentioned earlier. There's other evidence that gyrochronology appears to be broken, that the stars are somehow reaching a critical point and not able to efficiently lose angular momentum and spin through that place in the diagram. So that's really great. Um, so good for our annual report to NASA, but now the physicist inside of us has to ask why, what's happening? Um, just from these lines of sight alone, we can't figure out why this is, this is the case. We don't know independently the ages of all these stars. These are field stars. We don't know any of the other properties of these stars really. So we need to turn to another set of observations. Uh, and this is uh, open clusters is sort of the benchmark that you would next naturally go to, or at least is what we went to and what others have gone to. So this is, a, again, a diagram from uh, Tyler's paper where he's just reproducing with his periods the handful of well-published clusters that have shown up in the K2 data. There's other clusters as well in the K2 and the Kepler data, but here are just a few. Um, and you can see again, the, vaguely in the background, you can see the sort of the prawn, the, the gap, the bimodality, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then you can see these two clusters, NGC 6811, um, with an age of around a uh, giga year, uh, and Pricepi with an age of around 700 million years. And you can see that they, at uh, around 1.1 solar masses, they are split, they are offset from each other. One sort of seems to be on the top edge of the gap, and one is on the bottom edge again, with about 300 million years separation. For the low mass stars, for the 0.8 solar mass, these K dwarfs, these all appear to be on the lower edge of the, of the diagram. They are on the other side. You would naively expect all those green dots on the right to be above the gap, and instead they're on the below the gap. And so you can see that something is transitioning from the high mass to the low mass at this somewhere around a gig year or just before a gig year. Um, here's, I think, a, a cleaner diagram that uh, Jason Curtis made um, just showing again this this stall, this kind of uh, break in the uh, rotation evolution. So it looks like, if we were to read this right diagram, it looks like um, that the 6811 stars here in the red and the blue dots, um, that they, for the higher mass ones, the hotter ones, they have transitioned as you expect. They've continued to spin down, but the lower mass ones have stalled. Um, that's what they use. I think they use the word term stall, or they, they've broken their breaking, uh, as Jen Van Sater said. 
Uh, so this is really interesting. What happened? Why did they stop losing any momentum? They certainly have star spots. They certainly have magnetic fields. We can see the star spots. That's how we're making these measurements. So, so what's going on? Um, another example, again, using Pricepi and comparing it to the Hyades. So the Hyades uh, and Pricepi are often considered sort of like sibling clusters. They have roughly the same age, right around 700 million years. And what Stephanie Douglas noted in her 2019 paper using, again, K2 data, K2 has really been revolutionary for this, that the G dwarfs, so on the right diagram, uh, the G dwarfs, so the hotter end at the left side, um, their age, you would infer from gyrochronology, is about 70 million years older than in the case of the Hyades. This is the Hyades age minus the Pricepi age. You're subtracting this is a, kind of a confusing thing you're subtracting the distributions of the two clusters and the point being that the the higher mass stars appear a little older than the lower mass stars while we think the cluster should have formed all at once we don't think there's a 70 million year age spread in one cluster and the other um, but this goes in the same direction as uh, as jason's diagram here um another a third example of clusters being very uh, revealing here, when we get out to older ages, now when you get to older ages, so this is the case of NGC 6819 uh, and Ruprecht 147. These are two clusters with ages of around two to two and a half, maybe 2.7 billion years. So not quite to the solar age, but several giga years old. Um, this becomes really difficult work. As the stars get older, the magnetic field gets weaker and the star spots get smaller and it becomes harder and harder to detect rotation periods. So, our sample is very biased towards having lots of measurements of rapid rotating young stars and not so many measurements of these older stars. Um, but again, here on the right panel, you would expect um, if we extended the Pricepi model to, to this age, you would see that it would go up in this gray line. And instead, you get this sort of black curve where the, the stars seem to have stalled out as compared to where they should be. So our takeaway from all these clusters, and there's other cluster work that fits into this a diagram as well is that this McQuillan gap or the bimodality has something to do with some kind of mass dependent stall in angular momentum loss that there these features seem to line up with this gap and it seems to be mass and age dependent the fact that it traced a 600 million year old gyrochrone in my model is just kind of dumb luck um, it actually looks like this is a feature that takes place starting at a few hundred million years and continues out to several giga years when you get to the M dwarfs. This is we're seeing in the field, we're seeing all these ages and star formation history artifacts all mixed together. Um, and so there's some kind of age dependent evolution that's going on. What's really encouraging is that this doesn't seem to be completely outside of possibility anymore. These kinds of observations, especially the ones in the clusters have driven some theorists to take up the, the mantle here. Um, and I'm really, still trying to, you know, after a year now of reading this paper, I'm still trying to digest all the implications of this model for, from a Spada and Lanzafam of a rotational coupling between the convective and the radiative zone. So using a, a rotating um, stellar evolution model and letting the radiative core have some kind of time dependent coupling to the convective envelope. And so what happens here is the star forms, it contracts, and then there's some phase of coupling where the, the radiative zone and the convective zone can kind of talk to each other or, or angular momentum is transferred from that more rapidly rotating radiative zone in, more efficiently into the convective zone. And so they, the, they, the analogy here is that the radiative zone is able to provide extra angular momentum to the radiative zone, to the convective zone, which is, it's trying to lose angular momentum by winds. The spots and the activity is driving off mass and the winds are driving angular momentum away from the envelope away from the surface that we would see. But the convective zone um, is gaining angular momentum at its base from the radiative zone. So something is going on at that sort of interface layer called the tachocline. Something's happening at this point, which is propping up the rotation period here. And you see it here. Uh, did I highlight it? No, I didn't highlight it here. You see it here right by the Pleiades, this uh, black line, this M dwarf line. Um, the Pleiades shows the M dwarf line right at that sort of stall. And so the rotation evolution stalls out because the, these things can talk to each other. So it's a really interesting, it's a little semi-empirical or phenomenological, you would say, but it's really interesting because it seems to fit the, I mean, it's tuned to fit the open clusters, but it does seem to kind of generally fit this evolution. Um, you can see here 
Uh, again, comparing orange, which is Pricepi, to uh, green, which is 6811, uh, it's not as tight as um, in the observations that uh, Jason Curtis and uh, Stephanie Douglas had made. But this general model, this general framework does seem to be uh, populating this diagram in, in the way that we expect from our observations, that there does seem to be some mass-dependent, time-dependent break or stall in the spin-down, which is really interesting. Quick question. Yes, please. Um, so I'm a little bit confused because what you showed seemed to indicate there was this gap where there weren't stars of that rotation period for that age. And, right. and so that would suggest to me, rather than a stalling, a speeding up of the spin down, you know, sort of like crossing the Hertzsprung gap in stellar evolution. Yes. You go across there. But you, you are talking about these in terms of stalling models. I would think that would be more of a pile up where yes. you have distribution and a maximum rather than a gap. And so could you explain what, how, that's, how that's understood or? No, I can't explain it because I think this is exactly one of the issues. I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head. Okay. Uh, and let me go ahead and go to my next slide. You've okay, perfectly anticipated I, my next slide. I, I thought I was missing something, but. Okay. No, no, you're, you're following along perfectly. Okay, uh, thank you for that uh, totally perfect question, which is this uh, here, here I've highlighted this feature, this stall. This stall does create a pile up um we think a pile up especially for the low mass stars but the gap I mean, it's not there's not no stars it's not truly forbidden but things must move quickly through this diagram to get a gap um and so you kind of can see this suggested um here in the and again in the m dwarf line you can see that it hits the stall and then it speeds up really quick or oh, right not speeds up i guess it slows down really quickly because uh, we're losing angular momentum so the period increases quickly um, and so if you were to average through this and ignore this little shoulder you would have this smooth evolution that you would expect. Um, and instead, it must accelerate through this. You can kind of see it in the pink line, um, which would be a, a, a M0 or something, or a K7 or something like that. Um, but this, this speed up is not part of their model, is not tuned in part of their model. And so an open question that I, that I have, that I think a lot of us have, is if you take this grid of spin down models and you propagate it with a realistic smooth star formation history do you just get a pile up and then a smooth uh, slow tail to rotation or do you get a gap this especially for these higher mass stars these curves in red and purple and blue don't seem to have the right shape to produce the kind of gap that we expect so i think this is exactly the right question is sure we've got the the bottom edge of this of this of the prawn of the of the shrimp uh, populated with a, a stall but we need also a, a quick um, resurgence of rotation angular momentum loss uh, to get to the, the gap to actually appear um, and so a toy uh, implementation of this that i've made um, for this talk so this is not referee this is just uh, what i was playing with to illustrate this point um, on the right if you take the spot and lanza fame um, uh, gyrochrone grid that they publish and you populate it with a uniform star formation history and then you interpolate it um, into the period diagram on the left you get something I mean there's lots of artifacts because it's um, it's not a smooth grid um, but you don't get a gap you get a pile up there for the low mass stars on the bottom and then just a smooth smearing you don't get this gap and so uh, at least with this toy star formation history that I've injected it doesn't quite seem to tell the whole story um, that we're seeing in the field. So, so I like this general model that they propose. I'm adding one feature to this model. So they propose this, this, this I think, good uh, diagram of the generalized evolution of rotation for a star, which I think has a lot of the right pieces that we see. There is some initial rotation period. Now, their model assumed every star had eight days, which is not what we, what we see from young clusters and things. So th already the model is incomplete. There is some phase of contraction where the star is settling onto the main sequence. And then we see um the bottom of the diagram here the rotation period bottoms out at the zero age main sequence and begins its wind driven angular momentum loss and then there is some stall which occurs at some kind of fixed rosby number uh, or fixed point of um uh, confluence between the convective and the radiative zones so the, the tackle cline gets blurred or something is able to pull angular momentum up and you get a stall or something and then there must be some rapid resumption of spin down. It has to join this angular momentum loss trajectory again, um, and then continue to resume its sort of wind-driven breaking until it reaches some sort of final phase of what I'm calling, what I've labeled as broken breaking here, 
um, which has been seen in sort of the oldest stars, again, by Jen Van Saters, uh, at what point this no longer seems to uh, evolve anymore in a coherent or, or a steady fashion. And so rather than this sort of like T to the one half smooth line that was proposed in the 70s, um, we see that this diagram has lots of structure and we're probably missing features as well, uh, as we've noted here, that this resumption of spin down needs to be faster to get a gap in the field diagram. But this gives you an idea of, of the kind of grid of stellar evolution models that we need uh, to actually use gyrochronology to interpret the age of any random field star. We can't just take its rotation period and its color um, and interpolate uh, based on a few clusters. We have to actually have a complicated, uh, realistic model, just like we do for isochrones. And of course, just like for isochrone modeling, there's all kinds of garbage to do with, uh, or, or, or opportunity, um, to do with metallicity, which uh, Sean Matt's group seems to be um, finding a lot of um, dependence on spin down. So the ability to launch winds is heavily dependent on opacities. Um, and so metallicity plays a strong role. So we are going to see a metallicity correlation here. Of course, binaries throw everything for a loop, um, which is a, both a, a hindrance and also a great opportunity. So from uh, David Fleming's work here at the University of Washington from a couple of years ago, just doing um, um, binary evolution modeling uh, using simple gyrochronology evolution, you can populate the diagram in all kinds of ways with binaries. Even a small fraction of binaries can pollute this diagram in all sorts of interesting ways. Um, so those are confounding things. And we have very few clusters, right? The, the, feet, the figure on the right here, even though it has more than three lines from Soren Maibaum's work a decade ago, we've only got about six lines. This is still very sparsely populated at some very interesting phases, particularly even at the rapid rotating end. We have very few clusters. We really, really need more data, says the observer uh, forever. And so enter our new, friend, our new best friend, which is the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, which I spent the last couple of minutes talking about here. TESS is going to answer our prayers, I hope. Um, now, TESS launched uh, about two and a half, almost three years ago, uh, almost three years ago now, and is surveying something like 80% of the sky, not for four-year chunks, for something like 27-day chunks. TESS, I think, I will assert, is the next frontier for stellar rotation, um, at least for the next few years. Here are just six random stars that I pulled out of my own little um, period finding script. Ignore all the labeling. Just look at the fuzzy, wiggly sinusoidal lines and agree with me and nod your head that these look like sine waves. Good. TESS is going to find a lot of rotation periods. This is fantastic. This is exciting. TESS has already observed more stars than the Kepler mission. It's about uh, 300,000 stars. Um, in total, if you only include the two minute short cadence data, if you include the full frame 30 minute data, which is being released um, as we speak, mm -hmm. TESS has, re has resolved something like uh, 10 million stars, something on order of that. And so this really is gonna push rotation periods from even 30,000 into hopefully 100 or a couple hundred thousand stars we should have rotation periods for in the next few years. This is a huge revolution. Mm -hmm. Now there's a challenge uh, with 27 day observing sectors for most stars. Um, here is Tyler's diagram for the K2 data on with uh, 70 or 80 day observations, you can get up to almost 30 days of data of rotation periods. But uh, sort of the Nyquist frequency is something like 13 days, you can't get rotation periods very robustly for any stars with periods longer than about 13 days um, in tests with a single sector. And here on the right, we've just uh, plotted the test periods we've measured compared to the known periods for the handful of Kepler stars. We can treat Kepler as the ground truth, but we're going to do the same exercise with K2 soon. And there's not that many stars in this diagram. This is a diagram of like 20 points or something. Um, they do follow the one-to-one -one line generally. A few down at the one-to-two alias, this happens. Um, the only star that we had in our sample that gets out to a period in tests of teens of days uh, actually is an alias um, of a Kepler period um, that should be out about 25 days. Um, and you can see one star um, that we should have measured. We measured it to have a very rapid rotation period in tests, but it actually has a slow rotation period. Um, this is contamination. TESS has really huge pixels and contamination is a really big problem. So TESS is going to solve a lot of problems, but it is not a free lunch. Um, now there's some hope. TESS does have these overlapping sectors and at the um, equatorial poles, the continuous viewing zones. Um, and so here is one example of a long period eclipsing binary that we found. Uh, um, I think Assassin actually found it first, unfortunately. So 
Um, there is some hope that with multiple sectors of data, you can sort of stitch these together. It's not easy uh, calibrating um, fraction of a percent photometry over long periods of time is not an easy task, but there is some hope. Uh, Christina Hedges and, and uh, Ruth Angus and others have published what they call the Systematic Insensitive Periodogram or SIP, Systematic Insensitive Periodogram, um, where you are both detrending the data here originally in pink at the bottom, you're detrending it and measuring the periodogram at the same time. You're creating a linear model with both the periodogram and the detrending at the same time. And here they've recovered a known rotator, a known slow rotator with 50 day, 52 day rotation uh, using many, almost a year's worth of test data, many sectors of test data. So this is still computationally expensive, but it is uh, hopeful, at least for the uh, fraction of stars at the sort of poles or in the petals of this flower, if you can see the overlapping sort of the, the things in um, up to about green in this sky map. Tess also might answer our prayers in terms of observing many more young clusters. So this is an example of an ancillary data set that's now available on MAST, uh, the Cluster Difference Imaging Photometric Survey, or CDIPS um, by Bauma et al. They've got a few releases now of this data. Um, a few hundred thousand stars with light curves generated for uh, known young stars and clusters and moving groups in tests, most with multiple sectors of data. You can see here in the, all the blue dots are, are the targets they've gotten. Um, and I think this is a wealth, there, there's more than 150 clusters here um, that we can sample. Some of them are going to have great rotation periods. So this is work that we're interested in. I know other people are interested in as well. So this is an area I think where we're definitely excited for some collaboration if this is something you're interested in. Um, but this will fill, I think, our need for having many more clusters to populate that evolution, to look for that change in the stall and, and, and the spin down. Uh, now, this long duration data set, as my title suggested, allows you to find some rare things or some slowly moving things. Here is just a shameless advertisement for a paper that we're working on that uh, is, I swear I'm going to send it back to the referee any day now. Um, but this is a uh, evolving eclipsing binary called HS Hydra. Uh, this is now a former eclipsing binary. On the left is the historical data from the 1970s all the way into the 2000s. And then on the right is the data from TESS. And you can see the eclipses are so small, they look like exoplanet transits. And now the eclipses are gone. Um, there are lots of systems like this uh, to be found, uh, and also the opposite happening, where the inclination is changing and the eclipses will begin. So there will be uh, newly born eclipsing binaries um, as systems have pivoting, shifting, processing inclinations. This is very cool. Um, there's lots to do here that you can do finally with the 10 year space based um, baseline. Uh, and then finally, the last thing I'll show is just with 10 year baseline, you can start to look for changes within a single star itself. Here I've shown stuff for the sun. This is the well-known 11 year activity cycle on the sun. Uh, and I won't spend any time explaining this other than the left, uh, the leftmost diagram is the flare distribution. And you can see there's lots of flares and then there's less flares based on solar max and solar min. Um, and we have at least one candidate where over several years of data from the Kepler mission give you early data in blue, later data in the Kepler data in red and the Kepler mission in red. And then in tests we have flares uh, down in black. We think this star is undergoing flare um, occurrence changes, which is exciting. And so I'll just wrap up by saying there's a huge opportunity space in this combination of Kepler and TESS. Both individual missions are still undertapped. There's lots of astrophysics to be done. And then the combination of the two with 10-year baseline allows us to see things changing. Space-based photometry has produced the rotation revolution. I think that's a really cheesy thing, but I love it. Um, there's lots of interesting results here in rotation about breaking spin down, maybe fixing it, seeing the gap in K2 data. Uh, and I'm just so excited that TESS is going to solve all of our problems with the little asterisk being that whenever you start solving problems, uh, you find more problems. And again, students, this is what we call job security. And so with that, I would love to take any questions you have.